so as you all know, today we're going to be talking about framing, creating, designing integrations. Um, so at a high level, we have the integration lifecycle here. Um, generally, you design the integration, then it goes into development, then it moves into the implementation cycle. So design, pretty straightforward. Development as well, pretty straightforward. Implementation would be um, doing the beta process, rolling that out for your customers, seeing how that's going. Supporting is the ongoing support that each integration needs uh, because each integration is really a product in itself. Um, modifying that integration to meet the needs of your users as you're ongoing um, or as you're supporting that integration moving forward. And then the user research stage, uh, that's actually before the design stage, but it is a cycle. So you're always going around, you're modifying, you're going back to your people, you're talking, and then you're doing some more design. Um, today during this webinar, we're really gonna be focusing in on the user research step and then the design step. So those first two critical points for an integration. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our team members to talk a little bit more. Um, um, yeah, so, I think before we even get into user research, we probably want to talk about kind of asking some of the biggest questions before you go into a multi-week, multi-month development project, right? You never want to start spending money, start spending dollars um, before you really have asked yourself the big questions, like not once, but like probably three times. So you really are sure. Um, so the way I like to break that down is kind of macro and micro focus, right? So macro, what prompted the need for a new integration? And why do you need that right now? I think it's really, really easy, um, especially in the integration space where uh, people I like tend to just want to add logos to their website, right? The more logos, the more integrations you have, the more broad your app market place might be. Um, but that costs a lot of money to add each new integration and not only to add, right? Maybe it's a small incremental cost, but to maintain each of those is a whole nother story as well. Uh, so you really wanna ask yourself, like, why do you need it right now, other than the fact of just adding a new logo to your app marketplace? And so the way you can start to answer that is also by asking like, what are your broader business goals? Like, are you trying to, are you as a business trying to move like maybe up or down market? So you might be trying to um, attract smaller or larger customers, um, or are you trying to go after a new industry or vertical altogether? So let's say you know, you're know you only in the e-commerce space and now you're trying to hit the e-commerce social space, right? Like that could be a whole new sector to enter that might require a new integration to even get your feet wet in that area. So those are the types of kind of macro questions I would really start to ask. And again, repeatedly ask this to yourselves, like even as you're building it, if something changes and you don't need a need for it anymore, that's when you get ruthless and really think like, should I keep spending money on it? Now, once you've kind of dug into that a little bit, you wanna go into like kind of the more micro questions. You know that there's a need, you know what the business goals are, but now who specifically are you gonna be building it for? And so when I say who specifically, you wanna be thinking about personas. And so a persona is like, uh, think of it as like a fictional kind of character who represents like the goals and characteristics of a larger group of users. Um, so you never want to say that I'm only building it for one customer unless it is truly, truly necessary and your business is going to end without that, right? But you want to go after a group of kind of personas and then segments. And then digging into like what are their needs and frustrations, uh, which is kind of the next bit that we'll get into when we dig into like how do you conduct kind of user research. Yeah, and it's probably worth mentioning at this point, um, some of the questions are with the questions that Ayush is bringing up that we are, for the majority of this webinar, going to be talking about integrations that are used by large amounts of people. So multi-purpose integrations that aren't um, custom built for one customer. customer. Those, of course, those are, course very, are important. very important. They A lot of the similar components go into designing those, but in general, we're going to be talking about multi-purpose integrations for this webinar. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Um, because yeah, building actually very specific integrations for one user for one user um, is ironically easier because it's so well defined. Um, all right, so you're starting user research. Who do you start talking to before you're again? You start building. You start touching any piece of code. Um, there's really kind of three groups. Of, of people I, I like to think of to talk to before building. One is your stakeholders. 
this can this is usually internal and by people like in these category I think about like people on the sales side the account executive side maybe the heads of different departments and strategies uh the goal here is to get alignment and gather feedback because they usually are the closest people or closest touch points to the end users you know they're interacting with them on a daily basis they're selling to them and any selling is like the hardest thing of any business right and so they probably know the needs inside and out so once you talk to some stakeholders and get some alignment that hey this direction and the strategy is where we want to go uh, they can actually give you some recs on the next group of people to talk to, who are the users. Um, and so the users, right? It's this is this is a bread and butter. Like we're building for the users. And so you want to, you know, ask um, the stakeholders for some recs on who might be the best people to talk to. Uh, and the main thing here is you want to get users involved early and actively in the development process, because if you build something wrong and it's not for them then not much has been achieved. And so the goal is to gather feedback and validate direction and build relationships for potential beta users. So beta is something that we'll probably get into again later, but, and feel free to ask questions about as well. Beta is a whole kind of space to like, it's like a dance, but you can't just go up to everyone asking to be a beta user because you know your product is not gonna be at its finest state at that moment in time and you're going to be asking a lot from them, you know, hopping on calls, getting feedback, you know, try this out, try that out. So you really want to be selective when, when you find beta users. And then the third group um, of kind of people to, to scope out, and this is really specific for like integrations, especially is a partner manager. Now this isn't always required, mostly because getting your hands on a partner manager can be really difficult at times, but a partner manager is really going to be the person who knows the tech stack on which you're building on. So let's say you're building a Shopify integration, a Shopify partner manager knows their documentation inside and out. And so for you, they're going to be that knowledge base and that support as you continue building all the way through. Yeah. Um, and I guess just two points that I wanted to kind of highlight here is with users. So it, let's say we're being an, we're building an e-commerce integration, right? We have Jack and Jill's store. So we want to talk to Jack and Jill's store because we know that they use, let's say, QuickBooks really heavily. Um, but it doesn't really help, right? If we're talking to the person who's in charge of um, maybe customer support for Jack and Jill, we want to be talking to the accountant. So it's not only the, the customer that we want to really dig into, but who among that customer of ours will be actually using and working with the integration itself. Yeah. Um, all right. So now gathering feedback, right? And, and the key here is the more you have, usually the better it is. There's no, no such thing as you have too much feedback. So when you start talking to these users and, and like Natalie mentioned, right? Like not only because with integrations, many times it's like a kind of like a B2B play, right? It's like, my customer is another company. And so like Natalie mentioned, you want to be talking to the specific people within that company that you're building for, that's going to be using this integration, toggling the settings, messing around with the UI. You want to talk to those people. And so usually what you want to do is conduct user interviews. The more you have, the better uh, to help determine use cases for your integration, which Nick is going to get into next. Uh, the best kind of, you know, Conducting user interviews is, is an art a little bit, but kind of some of the three core things to go after are ask open-ended questions, nothing leading or directional. You want them to speak more than you. If you're speaking, I would say even 30 to 40% of the duration of an at one hour long call in a user interview, it, you're doing it wrong. Like you want them to speak as much as they can and ask these, you want to ask these open-ended questions. Another thing is stay away from yes and no questions. If you ask anyone, hey, you want this other data flow in your integration? The answer is always going to be yes. Nobody ever says no to more functionality. And so for your own sake and to help prioritize what their main needs are, you want to stay away from those. Um, and then one thing that Nick and I have done and that we've really found a lot of success in is just asking them to screen share and walk through, you know, what data from their you know, Amazon like dashboard, are they trying to sync over and what does it look like over there? And what are the naming conventions and all of that? 
the best way to get that data is just ask them to screen share and walk through like a flow that they're trying to do and record that because that's going to be the most golden feedback that you can get. Um, so th those are kind of some best practices on, on conducting user interviews. Another thing is reviewing relevant feature requests. So a feature request is kind of a term that um, a lot of companies use as think of it as like a wish list um, of, of features that both internal and external uh, folks might want. So the thing is, you want to go through these wish lists on maybe a month by month or cadence, like maybe a weekly cadence, but you don't need to do everything on there. The point of this feature request kind of backlog is that you can see themes of like, what are general needs that like I've seen 10 different people ask, maybe different ways, but I'm going to create one solution that kind of solves all of them. And so these are kind of user interviews and looking at feature requests are probably the two most immediate forms of getting feedback. And again, the more you do, the better. So Ayush, I have a question for you on that point. Um, coming from like a customer support, customer um, customer <laughs> service background, a mm -hmm. question that we find ourselves asking a lot is kind of what is your like magic wand or pie in the sky wish? Do you think that that's something that is beneficial in these user feedback conversations? Uh, to ask like that, like, like what is your end all goal type of question? Yeah, or do you yeah, think that's yeah. too broad? <laughs> Absolutely. I think I think that's a, also a great place to start um, because sometimes actually here's a great example, uh, specifically related to integrations. Sometimes the the customer has a goal in mind, but they're constrained by how their existing tech stack looks like. So with integrations, you can find a lot of middleware, right? Like one thing connects to another, which connects to another thing, and then it finally gets to you. Now, they're trying to find a solution that fits the way their existing tech stack works, right? But then when you finally ask those kind of like open-ended questions, you get their true goal, which might be like, hey, what's best for you as a customer is like, scrap that whole tech stack. We're going to make a better end to an integration that will connect the final and beginning piece all together um, and it makes their experience a lot better. So yeah, I love asking those types of, the more open-ended questions you ask, the, the better. You, you never know what you'll find when you ask those things. All right. So I'll start talking here about just how you would go about potentially designing an integration once you decide an integration is something that you might want to pursue. And an integration as a whole is kind of like a a bit of a complex topic, you know, how, how do you break this down? Um, or how do you even get started with the process of, of creating an integration in the first place? And really, I think the key here is you need to break down the integration into the core component pieces, because once you have those smaller pieces, you can do, you know, whatever analysis, uh, that you need to do on each of those pieces individually that make up the entire integration as a whole. And that's also going to be used in terms of prioritization of certain features, what can and can't be done. It all should start with just breaking this down, starting from the high level and breaking it down. And the high level in this case, you know, is, is the business case. What are you trying to solve by creating this integration? Like, as an example, you know, if, if you believe that your user base is all using a certain uh, platform that you'd like to build an integration for, you know, you have a, a significant portion uh, or percentage of your user base using an integration, then that could be your business case saying that, hey, we need to build this integration so we can support our core users or maybe prospects that are using this platform. Uh, and then once you have that business case, then you can break it down going back to, you know, Ayush's points before where you can define those different use cases behind this, this specific integration. And a use case would be something like, you know, when a <coughs> user triggers something that happens in one platform, let's see if we can automate that flow of data <coughs> to the target platform. Something similar to that. I'm obviously keeping it pretty vague right now, but I'm happy to go into any sort of details if there's any questions about that. Once you have those use cases, then you can break it down into the specific data flows. So, you know, this is where you would define specifically 
where does the data originate from? Where is it being pushed to? Is this a bi-directional integration? Is it a one-way push of data? What are all of the requirements? Uh, are there any sort of limitations? Things like that. That those breaking it down to the specific data flows is what will allow you, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, it's what will allow you to start prioritizing and really building out your scope for what you want to tackle for your phase one or MVP of the integration, what you might want to punt and tackle in future iterations uh, of, of the integration. And so, so and this all starts, so once you have all of the data flows defined, then you can start to really identify what's possible. And before you dive into exactly, you know, looking at the limitations and, and looking at the capabilities, things like that, I think it's really important to emphasize here that this entire process needs to have a documentation mindset. Without documentation, things are going to be lost frequently. Uh, and when you're looking back, you know, at a future date, you're looking back and trying to decide how this integration is supposed to work. It's going to be very difficult to decipher all of the work that's already been done, what should be, you know, what should be working and what you want to work on in the future. So document first approach uh, is, is always key to any sort of integration project. And not only for writing documentation as you go through the design phase, but also reviewing documentation. You have to look to see what's available. You know, for example, if this is going to be an API based integration, you have to look at the API docs. You have to have a really good understanding on how you authenticate uh, or how you're able to actually just connect with the other system, how you're able to transmit data back and forth uh and and find out any sort of other considerations that you might need to know and then based off of the use cases you also need to identify any sort of triggers that are needed uh or, or that should function with the integration you know for example if there's a if there's a user case that requires real-time sync of data uh for one reason or another then maybe that's something that you have to look at as a, as a webhook based integration where you can get some of that real time feedback. Otherwise, you know, maybe it's a, a polling based integration where you define a frequency that the integration runs on, you know, every 15 minutes, every hour, every two hours, once a day, um, whatever it may be. But that's, that's something that you'll have to define really early on, or at least figure out what what's what's possible and what's not. Um, some, some platforms don't have webhook capabilities in the first place. So that's something that maybe you rule out or you can you know, investigate further. Uh, and then diving into those API capabilities, you know, based off of the user feedback that you've already received, you need to translate that looking at, the, at any sort of documentation that you have, leveraging your partner manager if you have one, you need to identify what are the capabilities, what can we achieve to meet those, you know, the user wish list, and what is possible, what is not possible. You can identify what specific endpoints uh, can support a specific data flow. For example, you know, if ShipBob is integrating with an e-commerce store, the e-commerce store would typically push orders to ShipBob. So we need to determine if that e-commerce platform has some sort of endpoint that we can look at to retrieve order details or see if they can push those order details to us. Uh, and then finally, what are the system limitations? You, you need to see on both sides what sort of limitations you might run into when you're designing this integration. Rate limits is, is a really common one. You know, how many requests per second per minute are you able to send to a target system? Because you need to design this, this integration around any sort of limitations like that. And obviously everything that you are finding out here needs to be documented um, so that you, you know, whoever is designing the integration or the technical team that's going to review the integration can look at these limitations and build a plan around it. 
One thing I would add to that as well, real quick, is um, related to API capabilities. If you, if and when you kind of uh, come up with that full list of API endpoints or maybe webhooks that you might plan to use for your data flows, it's always good to, if you have a partner manager, to kind of shoot just those endpoints their direction because they'll, at, with any API that is not yours, you're at the mercy of if they deprecate something or not. And sometimes they do. And a partner manager, even if it's not public, they might have hint of like, hey, you know, we're probably going to get rid of this endpoint in like four months from now. So maybe best to use our webhooks, even if it's a little bit more effort on your end or whatever that might be. Um, so again, just another beauty of having a partner manager, if you can get your hands on one. Yep. That's, yeah. that's a good point. Uh, oh yeah, go ahead. Oh no, I was just going to also double down on that and say that, um, a lot of times working with companies we see for one reason or, or another, if they don't try to reach out or start that partnership conversation, um, maybe because they don't have someone whose dedicated job it is to do that. Um, but there really are so many benefits um, with the limitations and capabilities. If you reach out to someone and and say, hey, we really want to use like this component, but we need an additional filter. It's quite possible if you're having that dialogue with them, they'll be willing to add in some components that can make your life a little bit easier. Yep, definitely. And documentation, you know, if going back to an API based integration as an example, documentation might only go so far. Sometimes you could be running into some really poor documentation. And that's when you could lean really heavily on a partner manager to, to figure out what are the best practices, but, you know, what has worked well in the past, what doesn't work well. Um, can you review this design and make sure that, you know, we're on the right track? Yeah. And something else that, um, something else that is also worth mentioning is if that you know you have a competitor in the space that integrates with a certain system it never helps to take a it never hurts to take a look at what they're doing as well so another component of research that can definitely be utilized awesome so as part of design it's really important to figure out what is the gap meaning what are the different what are the specific limitations that you might run into when building the integration and how do you get around those? And the, a good place to start here is to go through a data mapping exercise, which really just means what is the field to field translation of data between the two platforms, the two systems that you're integrating with. And this can be as simple as just, you know, two columns in an Excel document where you just start listing out the different fields for a particular data flow uh, and then mapping out those fields. Uh, a good example, I, I think a pretty, um, a, a pretty easy to understand example here would be, you know, ShipBob might have an order number field. The platform that we're integrating with might have an order ID field. So order ID translates to order number. It's kind of like a one-to-one -one mapping. It's pretty straightforward. But in some cases, you might also run into some fields, especially some required fields that might need transformation of data, uh, which would re require, uh, you know, another step of mapping where, you know, the, the, the platform that you're integrating with has a certain set of values that you have to hit when you're calling this, uh, you know, the API request. And so you might have to do some sub mapping of those specific values to make sure that everything is meeting the requirements. And so once you go through this data mapping exercise, you'll start to uncover some of those requirements or maybe some fields that just don't align at all. And those are things that you just need to document as you go through each of these different data flows and, and then start to analyze those different, you know, the, the gaps that you're finding and figure out is there some sort of solution? Like, is there a workaround? Can we hit maybe, you know, another endpoint? Maybe we have to do this through a different endpoint entirely, or maybe this truly just requires some sort of product change. So you would just put in anything that you're finding here, um, and you would document everything there. And then, you know, a really important step here is to also pass off any sort of work, any sort of documentation that you're working on 
to the technical team, like to the, to the development team, whoever is going to be building the integration itself to review and then provide any sort of level of effort for each one of the specific data flows, because you need that level of effort in order to start the prioritization of you know what exactly you want to include in the MVP or the phase one of the integration, what you want, to, what you might want to include in the future. And so I think uh, I usually lead us through what that sort of prioritization framework will look like. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about prioritization and MVP versus V1, V2, V3, whatever that may be. Um, and there's a specific framework that we're going to go through a little bit. It's called Rice. Now, a lot of ship pub folks uh, who might be on call have have heard this a lot because we use this a lot <laughs> here. Um, but that's because it's a great it's a great web method of of um, prioritizing things. So, right, what what have we done so far? We've gathered the research. We've um, you know learned about our tech stacks inside and out. We've confirmed capabilities, and we've even gone to the point of designing kind of like what workflows that we want to build. Um, and the level of effort around each of those, right? But what we may want to build is not something, may not necessarily be um, all that we can truly achieve with a finite amount of kind of dollars and time. So that's where this framework comes in. So RICE, as you might be able to tell, stands for Reach, Impact, Confidence, Effort. And it's uh, essentially a quantitative framework to prioritizing different features. Um, now, a feature like this framework can be applied at any, I would say, level of an organization. So let's say you're at, um, you know, you're at like a division level, like maybe a feature might be build an integration and then another feature might be like create a new database, right? Like very high level, but you can also leverage this same framework when you're just designing the integration, right? We'll just double click into it. For example, feature might be sync orders from NetSuite to ship off, right? Very specific. It's a specific workflow. And then also with any integration, directionality is key. Make sure you add in directionality to these workflows because if you just say sync orders and stop there, you might not be aligned with what the customer wants. You might be doing more than is actually needed as well. Um, so you, you want to get specific. So how does this, how does this framework work? So in the first column, you know, you want to list out your features any and all, everything that you've designed and thought through up until this point. In the second column, reach. Reach is how many users will this feature impact in a given period of time. So it's arbitrary, right? And the whole point of this framework is that you're kind of, you're coming up with a quantitative way to measure different things rather than subjectively. So one of the best ways I like to kind of calculate reach is let's say you um, are expecting a hundred customers um, in like new hundred new customers in the next like half year, and you have done ten user interviews that fit that type of customer you're trying to acquire. Now let's say that for this sync orders example, seven out of ten in those customer calls that you had mentioned the need for this. So you can kind of think like, okay, if I scale that up, I talk to 10 customers, we're trying to get to 100, roughly 70% might want this feature. So that's a way to help kind of start to calculate reach. Um, so in that case, you know, 70 users. Impact is the next column. Again, it's all relative to each other. How much will this feature impact users on a relative scale? Is it going to be minimal impact or is it going to be massive impact? And so that scale, the three, two, one point five, um, and the quarter right there, that's actually a very commonly used scale for like a lot of product orgs and companies. So, um, and because it does a job, right? It 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 ranks things relative to each other. Um, confidence is the next one. How confident are you about the reach and impact scores that you just guesstimated, right? Um, this is this is where you can implement your gut feeling like, hey, I had pretty much no gut feeling when I spit out that number. All right, then put in a low confidence score and that will be calculated into your final rice prioritization. And then the last column or second to last column is effort. How much time and investment is required to build this? Usually people think think about this in like dev weeks or like person months, dev months, all kind of, you know, same thing, but different uh, units. 
and this is what um, Nick mentioned earlier, right? Like that's why finding the LOE, the level of effort is so key. So when you start doing, you know, you, you calculate the score, which is uh, reach multiplied by impact, multiplied by confidence over effort, you get a number. Now this number to you might seem like, well, what does that mean, right? It means nothing until you start comparing it to other numbers. The whole point about this framework is it's all relative to each other. So taking that first example, syncing orders from NetSuite to ShipBob. We know orders, I mean, as a, so ShipBob being a fulfillment company, orders is kind of key. So we know that most of the customers are gonna watch it, want it, it's gonna be a high impact thing and we're highly confident that orders are kind of important to fulfillment. So we calculate a score of 84. Um, now the second example, sync serialized products. So serialized being like an electronic, like a MacBook, right? Like your MacBook, every MacBook has a serial number at the bottom. It's a very unique product, right? Syncing those products from ShipBob to NetSuite. So now we're taking a look at two things here, right? One, syncing this very specific niche type of product, lower need, not many users ask for it in the interview. And then second of all, it's going the wrong direction. Maybe one merchant asks for it to go that direction so that they can visualize it in a dashboard or something on their end. But it's not really critical to sync those products from the fulfillment center up to the marketplace, right? Like the marketplace is kind of the hub at times. So it matters more, it's coming the other way. So when you calculate all these things out, you get a much, much lower rice score. And then this gives you a very easy way to prioritize. Like if I only have enough bandwidth to do five things, the top five of this list is what we should be targeting for the best of the business, right? Um, building anything, especially a general purpose integration, uh, you will never satisfy any and every need out there. Actually, that goes along with not even for building integrations, but for building anything, right? And so this is the best way that you can very quantitatively satisfy as much as you can while driving that impact to your business. Yeah, and I would just say here that um, I know we have a few more slides, but there is a slight chance that you're kind of looking at this and everything we've said and going, wow, that seems like a lot of work before even developing the integration yet. Um, but it really is incredibly important for a wide variety of reasons, including ones we've already talked about, but something that we've seen a lot um, at Pandium is people coming to us and just say, hey, we want an integration with this platform, just go ahead and do it. Like we think this is roughly what our customers want. So time and money is invested in building an integration, but then when they put that integration in the hands of their customers, it's not what they actually need. So that's sunk time and cost on building something that is maybe only satisfying like 10% of users. And it is really worthwhile to, to know that you don't, you don't know what you don't know. Um, this was something that was kind of top of my head earlier, but I wanted to ask both Ayush and Nick, um, when you're thinking about building integrations, um, I know a lot of times with like NetSuite, for example, you might be thinking, okay, we have a really, really good idea, like what this integration should look like. And you go into the user interviews kind of with that mentality. Um, how often or, or what kind of happens do you ever see that what you were expecting is is different from the reality after talking to people and how do you handle that? I would say it happens pretty often. Uh, usually when we're exploring a new integration, we're not the experts on that other platform. That other, you know, whoever we're interviewing, whoever we're talking to, they know that platform far better than we do. So our expectations going into one of those meetings um, you know, when we come out of that meeting, it might be completely, we might have a completely different understanding. And I think that's, that's actually pretty common, uh, you know, just integrating with a lot of different platforms in general. Like, I, I think it's pretty key to have that specific step, that interview step, so you can really identify and narrow down what should actually be built. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, especially with, uh, you know, the more complex the integration or platform that you're building for, the more that will come up as well. Um, but yeah, like Nick said, right? It's not it's not worth like tearing your hair out for that. Like it's part of the process, it's natural. Um, and then just accept that, you know, things go into building an integration knowing that like a lot of these like details within the workflows may change from your very first 
kind of spec that you design. Uh, and that's fine. That's that's a that's a process of building things, especially when you're building things on another API um, or a series of webhooks that you might not own and you might not maintain. And I imagine that would also be another reason for using a framework like Rice, because if you were looking at a list of things, you might assume, you know, these three things are the most important, but then when you actually break it down, things that you might not be thinking about kind of creep to the top. Is that something that you've seen? Yeah, I think so. Um, which is, which is, yeah, I guess that's the beauty of, of this, this framework, right? Cause it, it accounts for all the things you really do know, and then maybe the lack of confidence that you might have. And so it kind of puts those things into perspective. But um, yeah, I'm trying to think of some, some examples. I mean, you know, there will always be kind of new workflows that come up as kind of like the feature request, a wish list that, you know, we talked about before. And let's say something new comes up, right? Like still slap this framework on there and see where it lies with other stuff. Um, it might the one of the biggest things to kind of challenge, especially when you're building a like a general purpose integration, is um, be cognizant of sometimes who are what we like to call like the loudest customers or the loudest people in the room. Um, it's always, of course, right? Like we want to build what's best for the customers and satisfy as much as we can. Uh, but don't let someone being, I, I would say, like loud or kind of more like pushy on getting a particular uh, data flow created, uh, distract from your broader business goals and kind of what you guys are trying to achieve. Awesome. So in terms of materials, there's, there's I think there's one main piece of, of documentation that you should have, which is a spec doc. Uh, you can see an example of, you know, what the contents of that spec doc might look like, starting with the overview, any sort of stakeholders involved, um, what the scope of work is overall. What's your go-to-market strategy? Um, you know, some, some of those details like that. But this is really just a living, breathing document that ideally, you know, all stakeholders would have access to. It's going to be constantly updated during development. And it's also, it can be used as your kind of your source of truth uh, once the integration actually launches. And it's something that you'll be very glad to have even you know one or two years down the road after the integration has already launched you can always go back and refer to it and see all of the specific details behind the integration without you know maybe needing to ask a developer to dive into the code and figure something out um, that's that's really ambiguous so spec doc is really key here uh, and then testing and criteria you you really you really want to have a good testing plan as you're as you're getting started on building the the integration, uh, and it's one of the things that could potentially be missed is load testing specifically. Uh, you want to, if you have any sort of historical data that you can look at, or maybe you can forecast some of this data, you want to look at those periods of peak usage so you can you know, kind of form your test cases around those heavy periods of usage and make sure that the integration doesn't buckle under all of that traffic flowing through. Uh, because you don't want to get into a situation where you're live with the integration and then two months down the road, that's when your peak period starts and the integration can't handle it. And then all of a sudden you have all of these complaints, you have you know, the integration failing and, you know, all of these complications. So you really want to factor that in to your testing. Yeah, the last item I would call out with the testing template is um, don't only test the happy path because, you know, ideally if the happy path works, then that's awesome. But, but people are people. There's always going to be something that goes a little awry. Maybe a product gets deleted. Um, so add some more obtuse scenarios if you can think of them um, and see how the integration responds to that so you can proactively get ahead of that.